Let's, I'd now like to introduce leader of the Green Party, Ontario Green Party, Mike Schreiner. Thanks, Darren, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Bonjour tout le monde, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to uh, just give a special shout out to my guest today, Dr. Carolyn Witzman and Graham Cubitt. I want to thank both of you for the great work you're doing on housing affordability and addressing the homeless crisis in our province. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts on how we can tackle Ontario's housing crisis. I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm addressing you from my home in Guelph, uh, which is located on the Treaty 3 lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And I just want to reaffirm the Ontario Green Party's commitment to the truth and reconciliation process uh, and just express my deep gratitude for Indigenous peoples for your teachings on how we care for the land, the water, the plants, the animals, and the people who live here today and for the next seven generations. Across Ontario and every community, it's a real challenge to find a livable, affordable place to call home. Life has become increasingly unaffordable and one of the basic necessities like having a roof over your head is sadly not a guarantee in our province. Ontario had a housing crisis well before the pandemic and now two years into the COVID-19 pandemic, issues like housing and affordability have reached a breaking point, getting much worse. And we must act now because everyone deserves a safe and affordable place to call home. So right now the Ford government is having a housing affordability summit with municipal leaders. And not surprising, opposition parties were left out. This is a pattern. You know, Doug Ford refuses oftentimes to listen to good ideas uh, from other parties and from many grassroots activists. So people are facing a housing crisis. They don't care about partisan political stripes. People just want solutions and they need us all to cooperate, collaborate and work together. And so if we want to have a real conversation about addressing the housing crisis in Ontario, we need to have all four parties at the table along with experts, housing advocates and municipal leaders where ideas can be shared and we can speak for all Ontarians. So I challenge the Premier to take the housing crisis seriously, hear our ideas and work with us. In June, I'm proud to say the Ontario Greens released what some have called a masterclass housing plan. And I've been pushing hard at Queens Park to implement key solutions from our plan with legislative motions to stamp out sprawl and aggressively invest in an affordable housing strategy. But instead of collaborating on good ideas, the premier chooses to plow ahead with urban sprawl that destroys the farmland that feeds us and the wetlands that clean our drinking water and protect us from flooding. And let's be clear, sprawl actually makes life less affordable. People shouldn't have to commute hours just to be able to find an affordable place to call home. They should be able to find an affordable place in the community they live, near where they work, near where they, the businesses they support, their family, and the, with access to amenities and green space and all the things that make communities great places to live. So we know Ontario can do better and we know Ontario must do better. In the Ontario Greens, we have a plan that will increase housing supply and make housing more affordable while at the same time protecting nature. The three key components of our plan include building and maintaining an affordable housing supply. And we can do this by building 100,000 new permanently affordable rental spaces and renewing 260,000 affordable community housing spaces. We can end chronic homelessness by building 60,000 permanent supportive housing spaces, including with wraparound mental health and addiction supports and services. By significantly increasing housing supply through infill development, by expanding zoning options to allow for duplexes and triplexes as of right in streamlining the application process for secondary suites while at the same time combating speculation in the housing market. 
And we can do this if all three levels of government come together, work together, and work in cooperation with nonprofit, co-op, and social housing to supply. We need to immediately build more housing affordable supply in Ontario, including rental and home ownership options. And we also need to protect the supply that we have now and ensure that tenants are not fairly unfairly evicted. Right now across the province, unhoused Ontarians are forced to sleep outside in minus 30 degree weather. And it's just not right, it's inhumane. And any plan to tackle the housing crisis needs to include a robust plan to end chronic and temporary homelessness. Ontario cannot continue on the path that is on right now. We just can't afford it and we have to do better. So that's why today I'm pleased to have two amazing experts with us who can speak more to the housing crisis in Ontario. Dr. Carolyn Witzman is an adjunct professor at the University of Ottawa, an expert advisor to the Housing Assessment Resource Tool Project based at the University of British Columbia. And Graham Cubitt is the Director of Projects and Development at Inwell, a Hamilton-based Christian charity that creates affordable housing communities that support people seeking health, wellness, and belonging. And I've had a chance to um, uh, tour some of the amazing projects that Inwell has completed. So I wanna thank both of you for joining us today. And I wanna call on Dr. Witzman to share a few words on the housing crisis we're facing. Thank you, Mike. Um, I wanna start off by um, really reiterating a point that Mike made in order to really end homelessness and housing need across Canada, it's gonna need the coordinated efforts of all three levels of government and over a time frame of 10 to 30 years to undo the damage that's been done by 30 years of progressive um, uh, neglect of affordable housing at both the federal and provincial levels. Um, and that is going to have to involve a lot of cross-party consensus building. And that's really something I want to uh, stress um, that's come across in my research. So I am based in uh, the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people in Kitchissippi, also known as Ottawa. But we're working on a national project on needs assessment uh, that uh, involves 15 governments across Canada. Eight of them are in um, uh, Ontario, including the six uh, governments that are part of the uh, Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. And what we're trying to look at is how to address the needs of 750,000 households in Ontario, according to the last census, this was in 2015 data, uh, who are living in unaffordable housing. They're paying more than 30, in some cases, 50, 70% of their gross household income on housing costs, quite often overcrowded uh, accommodation. So um, an entire family living in a one bedroom apartment because that's all they can afford. And quite often, particularly in Northern Ontario and in uh, indigenous communities in very poor states of repair, perhaps not even with access to clean water. So that's what we have to grapple with. Um, it's uh, related to uh, house prices having gone up 30% over the last year, but the majority of people in housing need and at risk of homelessness can only afford to pay $750 a month in rent. And we know that for every one new social housing unit built between 2011 and 2016, 15 homes at 750 or less were lost. So the first thing that needs to be done, as Mike said, is scaling up nonprofit housing because it's gonna be very difficult to provide housing at 750 a month 
uh, for um, uh, using a um, and including profit in that motivation. I'm really, I'm sure that uh, Graham can talk a little bit more to that. So 100,000 new permanently affordable homes, 60,000 supportive homes, that's a great start as is retaining and making energy efficient over 250,000 more homes that um, are currently affordable, nonprofit, permanent rental homes. Um, pro provincial government can also ask municipalities, there's a lot of emphasis in the other housing summit that's taking place today around, um, uh, you know, uh, it's all the municipality's fault. It isn't the municipality's fault. They don't have the powers and they don't have the revenue to provide deeply affordable housing, but provincial government can provide support and it also can require targets of um, municipal governments that aren't just the number of houses in order to prevent uh, sprawl and have 15 minute neighborhoods, but also are at price points and at sizes that people need. Um, so Quebec allows Montreal to require 20% social housing. Um, the, it's quite possible for Ontario to do the same kind of enabling um, uh, legislation. Ontario can release a lot of its land for housing on top and Inwell, uh, Graham is from Inwell, has been doing some great housing on top of libraries and community centers and health centers. That's the kind of thing that can happen when there's genuine collaboration between provinces and municipalities. But another thing that provinces can do is they're responsible for landlord-tenant relations. There were 6,000 landlord-tenant um, board uh, eviction notices after COVID eviction moratorium ended um, in the middle of the COVID crisis. Um, and there needs to be much stronger rental protection uh, in order to avoid that hemorrhage of affordable housing for rent eviction, dem eviction, et cetera. And another thing that the provincial government is responsible for, and it's connected to lack of affordable housing, is um, the lack of income support. Uh, $790 a month in shelter allowance is a recipe for homelessness. Even the current minimum wage, it would take $22 an hour for a full-time minimum wage worker to afford any kind of one or two bedroom apartment across Ontario. So looking at scaling up social housing, looking at retaining existing affordable housing through stronger rental protections, and looking at income supports are three ways that the provincial government can really clearly help in um, addressing homelessness and housing need and attaining the right of affordable, adequate housing for everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today, Mike. Thank you, Carolyn. I uh, deeply appreciate you uh, joining us today and sharing your expertise. And now I'd like to invite Graham Cubet to speak about what he's seeing on the ground uh, with the work that Inwell is doing in addressing the housing crisis and supporting people uh, in, in uh, accessing housing. Well, thank you very much, Mike, for, uh, for the invitation to talk about this. You know, it's an important issue that's, uh, that's no longer just a fringe issue. You know, people who are on ODSP or Ontario Works or lost their job and are unemployed. Uh, affordable housing is now a commonplace conversation amongst families right across the province. Even homelessness, street homelessness, is now a common and unfortunately, you know, very quickly growing issue in communities right across Ontario. And, and we know we need to do something about it. So the fundamental possibility here is that because we all actually acknowledge that it's a problem, uh, cooperation and collaboration could be much easier than making this a, sort of a political issue between different parties. You know, I think that what we found, uh, what we found with Indwell is that when a community is willing to work together, all kinds of solutions can emerge. At the local level, uh, municipalities, uh, grassroots groups, rotary clubs, churches, all kinds of organizations are saying, how do we get involved in solutions? And when we come through our city councils, when we get municipalities mobilized, the, the national housing strategy, the co-investment funds uh, are there to, uh, to align with good project plans, 
um, at the provincial level, this is a key opportunity for, for you and all of our MPPs to lean into, uh, uh, into solutions in new ways. I think there's a couple key points where we could see this happening. I'll, sp I'll speak specifically most, mostly about supportive housing, particularly because that is an area where uh, Indwell's expertise is, is best and uh, where our familiarity is, is closest to the ground across uh, Ontario. There are very few supportive housing options uh, outside of the large urban centres and in the large centres, uh, those the programs that are there are inadequate for the need. Um, so how do we get supportive housing built? We know that health funds, uh, mental health and addiction are, are critical components to address in overcoming homelessness. We also know that, uh, you know, the federal government, when it makes investments in in mental health and addictions, it doesn't deliver those services. It, it does so through the provinces. If there was a, a clear alignment between the federal government, mental health and addictions particularly, uh, and our, our municipal or our provincial level um, ministries that are, are the same, we could, and, and we link that to the national housing strategy funding, there could be a tremendous uplift in new housing, new supportive housing construction. That would have a knock-on effect of being able to actually address the issues of uh, homelessness, street homelessness, uh, many of the issues communities are facing around encampments, uh, overburdening of like EMS services, policing, the, the other kinds of engagements, which at a, at a local level, citizens are very concerned that we take, you know, a humane and just approach to dealing with this, uh, these encampment issues. And by bringing those funds together, there's actually an opportunity to see solutions that, that save the local municipality money, save the province money, but most importantly, actually provide the needed results for the individuals and, and households who are impacted. I think another area that uh, we see is that with the, with the national housing strategy, there's been a change in, you know, the CMHC will work directly with municipalities or with proponents. It did take the province out of that equation in an unhelpful way. And so being able to bring that back to, um, bring the province back into the conversation in some sort of, I don't wanna say formulaic, but a predictable way would be very, very important to, to building the deeply affordable housing that's needed. Costs have skyrocketed over the last few, well, throughout the pandemic, but over the last few years. And so construction now is in many cases, 30% more expensive than it was two years ago. We have to acknowledge that in the formulas, the cost per unit formulas that were in place, you know, back in 2017 or 2018 don't work anymore. Uh, we need 25% of the project to be coming from the province because otherwise the capital gap just, uh, just can't be made up. You know, if we finance all that money, somebody will loan it to us, sure. But that loan has to be paid back and so therefore the rents have to go up. Uh, you know, if, if people need to pay 750 a month, how do we actually get, that's probably about half of the actual cost of construction. So how do we make up that delta? If somebody is receiving ODSP, that's maybe closer to 500 a month. So these are the real straight line financial formulas that we can all work out with you know, complete transparency, but it's about 25% of, of the capital cost that the province should be contributing. The benefit of those investments, and they are investments, they're not a cost, is that there's tremendous cost savings in other systems. Now, do we actually save money in health in terms of like spend less? We might actually be able to do a heck of a lot more with the same investment. So while we all say, oh, we need to invest more in mental health and addiction supports, maybe we just need to invest differently. Use the same dollars, but get 20 times the effect. That's what we find for a lot of indwells programs is we're using Ministry of Health funds uh, that would be spent in a hospital context, for instance, keeping a person in hospital versus in supportive housing can be 10 to 20 times more expensive per day. So those would be key areas that, uh, you know, we, we could see the province really make headway in, in improving services. And I think the last thing might be um, just figuring out how, uh, you know, policies at the local level, we talk about streamlining the planning process and all that. And, and you know, I can, uh, gross on for hours, just like any developer about the, the planning process. Fundamentally, we want to respect people who live in neighborhoods that, you know, we always say, how, how does a project love its neighbors like we would want to be loved if we live next door? We don't want shadow. We don't want bad lighting. We don't want ugly architecture. We don't want, you know, crime and garbage and all the other things that people worry about. 
But really in the end of, at the end of the day, where we see things get hung up is around parking and traffic. These are the issues that seem to be the deal breakers for neighborhoods, it, you know, in the end. Well, when we're 200 meters from a GO station, we should be able to actually build like with no parking requirement. We should be able to build in walkable downtown neighborhoods without a, you know, a one-to-one -one parking ratio and not to sort of run roughshod over neighborhood opposition, but there needs to be some policy, you know, policy frameworks that say duly noted design, make good design happen, but we can't hang up projects or go to the land tribunal uh, over some of these issues, which really are getting in the way of delivering a core human need and in fact, a basic human right. That's a complex question because obviously uh, the local voter votes in the folks who make the rules. But if we have the courage to say, in this time of climate crisis, in this time of housing crisis, at a time when people who don't have the income to drive cars, but may actually do really well uh, living in a walkable or cyclable neighborhood, uh, how do we get over some of the things that really are the, at the end of the day, stopping us from building the housing we need? I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. I really appreciate you sharing your expertise and your final remarks there. Uh, reminded me of a conversation I had with Dr. Witzman just before we went live, where she introduced me to a new term from Australia called Quimby, quality of life in my neighborhood. And so I'm going to add that to my, to my lexicon. So uh, with that, I'd like to just say thank you both for joining us today. And I now open to taking any questions. Thank you. We'll now move to the Q&A portion of the press conference. If you have a question, please use the raise hand function. If you have any issues with that, just message in the chat or message me directly. Um, and we'll start with one question, one follow up for the time being. So first up, we have a question from Adam Donaldson. Please unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you, Darren. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, there was a meeting of Guelph City Council this week uh, approving the, the latest iteration of the growth strategy. There were at least a couple of developers that delegated who seemed to be of the opinion that the problem is uh, more stock related as opposed to any of the other housing issues you're, you're, you're mentioning. I'm curious your thoughts. Can any of these goals you're talking about at a government level be achieved when developers are still predominantly concerned with profits and making as much money as possible in the, the market? Yeah, that's a great question, Adam. And uh, I would think one of the things that's really separated the Ontario Greens housing strategy and why I think we've received so much positive feedback across the political spectrum and from a number of, uh, you know, sources is both the fact that we're talking about that we need government to get back involved in housing, uh, especially when it comes to building deeply affordable housing, which is a focus of our conversation today. And, you know, when both the federal and provincial governments got out of the housing game in the 1990s, we've seen the housing crisis get worse year over year, as Dr. Witzman said, over the last three decades, where it's now reached a breaking point. And so it's clear that we're not going to address the housing affordability crisis without the public sector getting involved, government at all levels, all three levels working together uh, to start building um, uh, permanently affordable housing and permanently supportive housing uh, to address that deeply affordable gap. But we also need to engage the private sector as well. And so I think it's a false choice. Some parties are saying only the private sector needs to be engaged to address the problem. We just need to increase supply. Others are saying, no, it's only the public sector. Uh, and I'd say both. And so I think that's one of the things that separates our plan. And one of the reasons I mentioned the changes in zoning rules are, are so vitally important to make it easier for people to build um, duplexes and triplexes and secondary suites and tiny homes and, and uh, basement apartments and other ways to increase housing supply within our existing built environment. Uh, and in some cases, that will actually make home ownership more attainable for people because it will provide additional revenue sources uh, for homeowners while increasing housing supply. So I think we need solutions that both engage government and the public sector 
and engage the private sector. I would agree with uh, Mike and Adam. I just want to add that right now, social housing is only 4% of the housing market, nonprofit housing. Uh, in the, from the mid 60s to the mid 80s, Ontario was the most ambitious provincial government in Canada. There were um, most of those years, 10% of new housing starts were nonprofit. There were a couple of years in there, uh, about 74 and 84, I think, where it was closer to 20% of housing starts in Ontario. So part of it is scaling up nonprofit housing, absolutely. When you're talking about supportive housing, that's not really something that the private sector is interested in or can particularly do well. Um, but uh, all of the sort of small scale, um, but it'll add up uh, stuff like uh, duplexes, triplexes, even possibly sixplexes in some established neighborhoods with um, good infrastructure is going to make a huge difference to affordability. Mm -hmm. I'll very quickly add to that. I think you're dead right. The market can really work functionally uh, without a lot of government intervention and investment at the small scale. The, all of those scales that you just talked about are very cost effective for you know, part nine, general contractors uh, to work in, even homeowners to build their own uh, secondary suites or, or, or such. When it gets into building, building larger scale projects and uh, particularly you know, multi-residential or multi-story buildings, Obviously, you're moving into a commercial type of construction and the costs are different. Um, there is no market mechanism to build apartments that rent for $700 or $1,000 outside of government investment. This, the pure financials of it is that it costs too much. Therefore, there is a role for government to play, but nobody wants to live in government housing, so-called. Uh, so I think we need to like work closely with the nonprofit sector, with the, you know, with the community housing sector to say, if we're going to invest public money, we want permanent public benefits. And you have those permanent public responsibilities as a not-for-profit or as a charity to hold on to that, that public value. In Dwell's a registered charity, we use government funding all the time. But what we do is lock in uh, the value to the community, to, the, you know, to us as citizens for permanent rental affordability in, in perpetuity. That's, a, that's an incredible investment in locking in today's costs because they're not gonna go down in the future, they're only gonna go up. And so how do we lock in? This is why we wanna build as much as possible now, rather than a year from now, so we avoid those further you know, cost increases. You know, inflation is now at what, six, 7% we hear. Well, if we keep going at this rate, you know, it's gonna be more expensive to build next year and the year after and the year after. So getting going now would be really, really critical. Thank Can you. Do follow-up? Yes, I was gonna say, uh, for my follow-up, I'm gonna flip it around a little because also at that meeting uh there was someone a young person who delegated and said that you know the last two years they've pretty much lived in a shoebox and I, I think they're referring to lockdown in small apartments there is still this for lack of a better term Canadian dream about the single detached home and uh the big backyard and and these sorts of things the things you're talking about kind of confront or, or kind of pour cold water on those dreams not everyone can we'll be able to take part in that, especially if we're talking about limiting sprawl and uh, growing within borders and these kinds of things. So, I mean, what's the message to the people who still have that dream in their head? Yeah, Adam, so um, that, that's a great question. And, and one of the, the reasons that I think uh, Graham's point about, and by the way, if you've ever gone uh, toured any of Indwell's uh, properties. I mean, they're beautiful. Like you, you know, you don't think you're in um, deeply affordable nonprofit uh, housing spaces. Uh, the homes are, are are beautifully designed and and shows the possibility of doing that. But one of the reasons that talking about building great communities with amenities that are accessible to people, green space, parks, access to small businesses, and thriving main streets access to transit, um, access to the vibrancy and vitality that make communities great places to live is so vitally important because in many respects, that's what more and more people are wanting. And so we can have a balance of uh, gentle density, building middle, missing middle uh, uh, homes for people, 
uh, that are have um, green space, amenities, parks, uh, thriving local businesses and main streets and commercial areas, readily accessible to people, connected through transit, walkability, uh, et cetera, that are great places for people to live. And especially more and more young people, that's exactly what they want. And you can also have um, duplexes and triplexes and gentle density housing available to people that includes having access to your own yard and, 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 uh, and personal outdoor space and things like that as well. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to just making sure it's designed in a way that, that, that provides that. And, and I'll just close by saying that, you know, one of the things that, that we have to be honest with people about is, is we can't continue in Ontario to, to lose 175 acres of prime farmland each and every day in this province and still be able to feed us and to have the land base that contributes $50 billion to our economy and over 800,000 jobs in the food and farming sector. Uh, we've already paved over 75% of our wetlands in Southern Ontario. Um, those are the wetlands that are vital to cleaning our drinking water and protecting us from flooding. And we simply can't continue to, to lose them. And so, and we can't continue to ask people to commute two hours or longer uh, to, to be able to afford to find a place that they can call home. I mean, the cost of that for people is making life increasingly unaffordable for people. So let's build great communities with uh, gentle density and with livability and connectivity and affordability and sustainability built into those communities. I'm just going to say a quick um, uh, word or co-ops, which haven't been mentioned so far, cooperative nonprofit housing. I was lucky enough to live in a co-op for eight years in central Toronto that had great communal play areas where we're bringing up two kids, um, great shared barbecue, great sense of community, and you know, steps away from a streetcar. So what we have there were a lot of the things that people are looking for when they're looking for home ownership. We had security of tenure, we had a strong sense of community and we had great um, space um, for our kids. So there's a, a lot of things that we used to do really well, including co-ops and we need to do more of again. I'll just very briefly add from a rural context, there's lots of space in rural communities that service land. Um, what we see is very few builders actually. And uh, in, the, in the market side, if you can build a house and sell it for 700 grand, or you can build a, a house that you then have to rent out, most people have the stigma about, oh, I don't wanna be a landlord, it's too much hassle. Uh, you know, so people, the market is just building homes for sale. I think that the price point though is not what people who are entering the market, younger people, people who are working at $22 an hour when they finish college and are working in the industry that drives Ontario's economy. These are the people who no longer actually can find a place to live where the jobs are. And I've talked to many active people who say, I spend half my time on Kijiji searching for housing so that industry in my community can attract workers. We have a massive, massive problem across Ontario of zero availability of somewhere to rent. As a young person, you're actually looking for somewhere to rent that's cheaper than what you can afford so you can save up some money, so you can get a down payment. And as long as somebody who's 20 years old is paying 1,500 or 2,000 bucks a month for an apartment, because that's the only thing available, they'll never save the money they need to become a homeowner. And that's the deferring of the dream that we see. And it's putting it off to some point in the future, which may not ever arrive. And I think that, you know, they say hope deferred makes the heart sick. Nobody believes that you can buy a home now in Ontario when you're 20 years old for cash, that those days are gone, you know, or that you can pay for something that's like only five times your annual income. Uh, you know, those days are gone. But how do you even start? And because you can't rent anything that you can even afford on a decent job in Ontario anymore, people are getting tired and, and, and fearful that their future may be destined to poverty. Thank you. Next up, we have Eli Ritter. Eli, please unmute yourself and go ahead. 
Yeah, thank you for taking my question. Uh, it goes a little bit broader than um, just housing, which I know is the topic today, but um, we have a uh, new polling out from Abacus data uh, released today that showed the Ontario's PCs lead by 9% over the Liberals, um, but 50% of Ontarians definitely want a change of government ac uh, according to this uh, polling ahead of the next election. And uh, Mike, I was just wanting to look for sort of your reaction on that. And I mean, it can be framed in, in sort of the topic of housing, because, you know, that's part of uh, the election and that is an issue. Um, but uh, maybe there's something that uh, you can say in response to that. Well, I would just say that, um, you know, the election is still a few months away. And as we've seen in so many other elections, uh, a lot can happen uh, in, in just a few days in politics. And, and so, you know, I think we're, we're at a stage now where uh, every party, including the Ontario Greens, are putting forward their vision, their values, their policy priorities, and the people of Ontario will ultimately decide what kind of future um, they want. And, and I personally believe from knocking on thousands of doors in Guelph and in communities across the province and just interacting with people that, you know, one of the top issues for folks is housing affordability. And, you know, the, the, not only the dream of home ownership, many people are feeling slip away, but just even finding an affordable place to rent uh, and Graham, when he mentioned the challenge employers are facing, I'm meeting with a number of employers across the province who are having trouble attracting staff uh, because their staff can't afford to, to live uh, in, in the community where jobs are available. And so I think addressing the housing crisis is going to be a top priority issue in the upcoming election. And it's one of the reasons I'm so proud the Ontario Greens uh, released what some people have called a masterclass uh, housing strategy um, last June. And, uh, you know, it's those kinds of issues that we're going to bring in solutions we're going to bring forward to the people of Ontario, uh, because I think that's what they deserve is honest, an honest conversation about the challenges we're facing and real solutions to address those challenges. Thank you. Um, next up, we have an emailed question from Matthew Bingley at Global News. Um, the question is, the Premier and his minister were speaking about the need to cut red tape to address the housing shortage and get more construction projects started. What concerns do you have for the potential environmental impacts of this approach, especially considering the government's history of using MZOs? Yeah, well, my biggest concern is, is that oftentimes when the Premier says we need to cut red tape, what he's really saying is, is we need to cut environmental protections. And over the last three and a half years, we've seen a systematic dismantling of environmental protections in Ontario, whether it's gutting the Environmental Assessment Act, um, making it easier for, you know, below the water table aggregate extraction, um, gutting of the Endangered Species Act, proposals to uh, build highways in the case of 413 spend you know, $10 billion building a highway that's going to pave over 2,000 acres of farmland, 400 acres of the Greenbelt, cross 85 critical waterways. Um, that his definition, the Premier's definition of cutting red tape is dismantling environmental protections that are so vital to our quality of life, our communities, and protecting us from extreme weather events fueled by the climate crisis. Uh, and Quite frankly, you know, the government's uh, misuse and abuse of ministerial zoning orders, uh, in particular, I think of, you know, the, the proposed MZO to pave over um, the Duffins Creek wetland to build an Amazon warehouse, uh, you know, those are just misguided priorities. Uh, we can address the housing affordability crisis by increasing affordable housing supply within our existing built environment by engaging with nonprofit and co-op housing providers, by making it easier for, for homeowners and, and private sector developers to um, you know, have duplexes and triplexes and you know, uh, gentle density and uh, missing middle uh, apartment and housing 
solutions within our existing built environment. We have enough space within our existing built environment. Uh, if the premier was serious about making it easier and quicker, he would reverse the changes the government made to the Ontario land tribunal process, essentially bringing back the old OMB process, uh, which enables um, developers and others uh, to appeal decisions that they, they, they don't like. And quite frankly, you know, if, if a proposal is in line with local planning rules and the provincial policy statement, then it should be able to go through without delays through appeal processes, which oftentimes cost municipalities in particular millions of dollars. Thank you. I can speak to, uh, may yeah, I yeah. speak uh, to that briefly? For cutting sure. red tape, I totally agree, doesn't have to uh, mean cutting uh, environmental responsibility. In fact, I think you know we can build all of the affordable housing and all of this housing we need to standards like passive house with no particular extra cost to the construction. Where we see red tape happening time and time again is just like Mike said around uh, frivolous appeals. Uh, you know, when it comes down to like a difference of like a parking ratio for an urban walkable site that's an infill and a brownfield, there should be like zero ability to appeal that. Um, there should be there where we get hung up is like at a local level in municipalities. You know, a 13 meter garbage turning radius on site is required by some local bylaw. It's garbage parking density that become the things, the red tape that we run into and, you know, urban designs, you know, suggestion or slash requirement that we put a balcony on every unit. Things like that become complete red herrings to the point, to the crisis that we're in and actually delay projects by months. There could be a suggestion along the lines of if a project is looking to target a rent uh, or an affordability that says such and such below market, and if it's going to receive, you know, federal, provincial, municipal investments as part of that, that we set an expectation of something like a three-month planning process. And it's just like, if you get to the end of that and you haven't made up your mind as the local municipal planner, time's up, moving on. Uh, we've had this experience in one county where they said, well, we give our staff three weeks to respond. If they don't respond, we just presume that they don't have any comment rather than like waiting and waiting and waiting for one person to leave it on their desk, you know, while they're on vacation for a month or whatever. That's the, that's the reality that we're in is that people, one person can hold up the process uh, for, these pro for these projects for months. And that's the kind of red tape where we could change very quickly with some expectations. Thank you. Um, if there's any more questions, please use the raise hand function or message in the chat. Otherwise, that will conclude today's event. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, Mike, a few words to wrap up. Thanks, everyone. I just really want to emphasize that we have solutions to the housing crisis. We can address the housing affordability crisis by re-engaging the public sector, getting government back involved, partnering with nonprofit and co-op housing providers like Endwell, following best practices and expert advice like the fantastic research that Dr. Witzman has uh, provided and numerous other uh, academics uh, 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 across Canada. Uh, and we need all three levels of government working together, aligning priorities to ensure that we can build the kind of affordable housing we want, we need, and in the existing built environment and in the communities that people want to live in. We have the solutions. Let's get to work doing it. And I want to thank you all for joining us today.